Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder if there's anyone else like me who has thought <laughs> like this. Maybe you see a couple. Maybe you're walking. You're taking a walk, getting some exercise. And then you see a couple across the street coming your way. And then when you can finally see them clearly, you know they're a couple, they're holding hands. Maybe this has occurred to you. They kind of don't match. <laughs> like, maybe you're like, ooh, you know? <laughs> what <laughs> is she thinking? No, I can't be. And here's the thing, people. It's in the Bible. Think Leah, right? Not so much. He wanted Rachel instead. So read your Bible so we can think about these things. It's okay. They don't match because it's weird because they normally do. So you work with someone for a while and then finally you meet their spouse and you're like, oh, I can see that. It's what occurs to you. Usually that's like the norm. Like, I, I get that. They, they work. But when they don't, it's weird. Kind of throws us off. Now, here's another thing you might think, and let's just get really honest today. Like, let's say it's an older gentleman with a beautiful young woman. What do you think? He must be loaded. Or she's loaded in a different way. I don't know. But it occurs to us, hey, look, it's Naples. It happens down here a lot, right? So maybe you think that. Why are they together? They don't look like they go together. Well, I heard a story about a case that wasn't like that. It was like that, but it wasn't like that. Beautiful young girl gets a boyfriend, but he's not very good looking, if we're being honest. Well, she brings him home to meet the parents. Now, this is a couple where the dad is quiet. He has followed my advice. That's how he made it through all those years of marriage. He doesn't talk very much. <laughs> right? You can be right or you can be happy. Pick one. Mutually exclusive. Anyway, brings him home. But the mom, not so much. She expresses her opinion all of the time. So the guy arrives at the door, and she's kind of like looking over his shoulder, like, do I have to sign for a package or something? Who is this? No, this is the boyfriend. Come on in. So she's kind of suspicious. She thinks like that. What's going on here? He must be loaded. She doesn't waste any time. They're sitting down at the dinner table, and she goes, so what do you do for a living? Are you like a hedge fund manager or a banker? No, no, no. I'm a teacher. Okay. Well, like a tutor for the president of the United States or something? You know, like, what kind of teacher are you? No, 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 just an elementary school teacher. So she's like, oh. So gets through the meal. They leave, and she has a talk with her daughter. Like, what are you thinking? He's not rich. He's not handsome. What? He's nice. And the mom's like, he has to be, right? So it's just not working in the mom's head. Well, then they get engaged. Now the mom's like, oh, what are you doing? You know, you can have nice and wealthy at the same time. Like, you can actually have both of those things. But no, 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 you don't get it. I, I love him. She's like, okay, whatever. They finally get married, and they decide to do something different, which allows for the mom to take a little bit of a jab. She says, oh, we're going to get a portrait painted. And the mom goes, yeah, good, better than a photograph. Maybe you can pay the artists off to fix them, right? You know? So stop it, mom, whatever. So they do the wedding. They have the honeymoon. They go through that whole phase. Then they move into the house where they put the portrait prominently on the wall where you can see it just when you walk in. They invite the parents over for dinner. Well, mom comes in and sees the portrait immediately. <laughs> the bride comes over and she says, yeah, you know, mom, I'm not really happy with it. And the mom's like, okay. Yeah, you know, I just don't think it does him any justice. The mom says, justice? With a face like that, he doesn't need justice. He needs mercy. 
And we're going to talk about mercy today. It wasn't one of my best ones, but, you know, I had to find mercy. You know, it's, it's a difficult one to make a joke out of anyway, without getting terribly inappropriate, which we kind of almost do sometimes here anyway. Today we find ourselves in our series, The Rest of the Story. If you're new, this is where we are looking at the whole Bible. And through the series, there are a lot of parts that are, people go, Whoa, I never heard that before. So we're really honoring God's word. This is our program guide. We don't add anything to you, take anything away. This is what it is. It's perfect, written by the perfect author. Nobody can come up with a better idea than that, even though a lot of people think that they do. In this series, we are in the accounts of the kings. So we're looking at 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. We saw last week... Went through a lot, right? We saw how it attached to Isaiah. And so we're kind of going in chronological-ish order, which means that we have to take different books of the Bible and reinsert them. We also took it all the way to Matthew. So we saw how all of this points to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. That's the main thing. That should be the main takeaway. So last week, we looked at King Ahaz. We saw he was unfaithful. We talked about faithfulness versus unfaithfulness, and that'll tie into today's topic. So today, we arrive at Hosea, and there are a few places where you could put this, so you're taking the prophets and you're putting them back into the kings. It's about-ish right here. It's very hard to place them very, very exactly, so I'm trying to do this topically as well, so they kind of tie in and we get some themes here that we're looking at. Hosea is tough, really tough, 14 chapters, short chapters, um, it's a tough read, so I'm going to summarize for you and give you some of the main verses and points here as we go through. But I'm not letting you off the hook from reading it. <laughs> go home, read it. It's important. Honor God's word. So just because I'm skipping something here doesn't mean I'm condoning skipping something for you. So let's jump right in. Hosea 1.1. The Lord gave this message to Hosea, son of Beri, during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. So if you've been paying attention, there you go. There's Ahaz right there that we talked about last week. So it's kind of in this time frame. Hezekiah, we're going to get to him later, but we've talked about the other kings. Now, here we get to the real crux of the whole thing. Hosea 1-2, when the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. So you'll want to be a prophet. (laughs) Really? (laughs) So we're going to get to Ezekiel. It gets worse. Like, there are a lot of crazy things that these prophets have to do. That's a crazy thing. So it's an illustration. Clearly, that's what's being said here. But then, (laughs) three kids, and they're all to make an illustration. They're to demonstrate something about Israel's behavior and then what's going to happen later. So First one, Jezreel, God plants. You might have heard that before in the Bible. That's what it means. It's a place, Jezreel, God plants. It's a him. Lo Ruhama, it's a her. It means no mercy. God will not have mercy on them. Lo Amai, a him, not my people. That's what they mean. But Hosea 1.10, yet the time will come when Israel's people will be like the sands of the seashore. Too many to count. Then, at the place where they were told, you are not my people, it will be said, you are children of the living God. Then the people of Judah and Israel will unite together, they will choose one leader for themselves, and they will return from exile together. What a day that will be, the day of Jezreel, when God again will again plant his people in his land. So if we turn the page, not going to read that one to you because it's kind of graphic. (laughs) So maybe that'll entice you to go home and read it yourself. It's a little bit crazy. Basically, Gomer, don't name your kid that, is a prostitute. But there's kind of this give and take here. So she's doing really bad things, description as a prostitute. Anyway, 
moving on, but then there's going to be a time when he takes her back. So it's this kind of thing like, you're bad now, I'm going to punish you, then there's restoration. But Jezreel, Hosea 2.23, at that time, I will plant a crop of Israelites and raise them for myself. I will show love to those I called not loved. And to those I called not my people, I will say, you are my people. And they will reply, you are our God. If we turn the page, Hosea 3.1, then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. Man, <laughs> this is tough. So it says that it's talking in his voice now for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a little bit of wine. He buys her back. Pretty good deal. <laughs> then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. So this is an illustration that they're going to be without a king or a priesthood for a time. Kind of a crazy way to illustrate it. <laughs> Hosea 4.1, hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you, saying, There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You make vows and break them. You kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, one murder after another. That is why your land is in mourning and everyone is wasting away. Even the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the fish are disappearing. So there's kind of like that courtroom scene like Isaiah that we talked about where he's pronouncing judgment on them. More punishment for idolatry. Hosea 5 deals with the evil priests and the punishment on them. God says he's torn them to pieces like a lion if you turn the page. Hosea 6, 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. Now he will heal us. He has injured us. Now he will bandage our wounds. In just a short time he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the rising of dawn or the coming of the rains in the early spring. Restoration, return. Hosea 6.6, 6, key verse. I want, to show, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. Save that. So, seven, <clears throat> trusting in other nations. We saw Tiglath Phileser. Sounds like a good heavy metal band name. <laughs> they went to, Ahaz went to him. The Assyrians didn't work out, right? So shouldn't trust in them. Israel's apostasy in 8, 9, punishment, 10, judgment and captivity. Now Israel is going to be depicted in 11 as like a child that God loves. So it goes from a prostitute to a child, just depictions of certain things. 12 and 13, a charge against Judah and Israel. And then we get to 14, 1, return. O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer you our praises. Assyria cannot save us, nor can our war horses. Never again will we say to the idols we have made, you are our gods. No, in you alone do the orphans find mercy. So we talked about faithfulness last week, but there was a natural response. I got it from some people. So we're talking about being faithful in the relationships we're in. And I likened it, you know, not just marriage, because some people aren't married. I get that. So like team members, a sports team in the military, when you have to count on other people, right? And you have to trust in them Right? So everybody stays in their lane, that they've got their job, but at the same time, you have to be faithful in yours. Natural question, what if they're not being faithful? What happens? So we see here that their lack of faithfulness shouldn't affect yours. Very important. Their lack of faithfulness should not affect yours. We see that although Gomer plays the prostitute, we also see that Hosea remains faithful. Important lesson there. Now, we looked at Matthew last week, 
So I showed you how sometimes they quote these books. Now I want to go back to Matthew and explain something to you before the quote so you get the context. So Matthew chapter 9. You're going to see the calling of Matthew, the apostle, or Levi. He's called, and then he goes and follows the Lord. Kind of like Isaiah 6, if you remember it. It's Isaiah's cleansing and call. Same type of thing. Matthew's called. But here's the deal. He's a tax collector. And you're going to see all over the New Testament especially, they're despised. Nobody likes the tax collectors. Why? Context. They're all Jewish people at this point. Very little interaction with anyone who's not Jewish. You know, Roman soldier, Syrophoenician woman, things like that. But mostly Jewish people. Well, so you have this Jewish person who's a tax collector. If you can't pay, he's going to do what? Charge interest. Well, if you read the law of Moses, Jewish people are not supposed to be charging interest to other Jewish people. So they're lawbreakers. They're sinners. And so on and on and on it goes with the tax collectors and the sinners. And they're usually like synonymous. It's one of the worst things you could be in this mindset. So you've got to keep that in your mind when this interaction happens. So Jesus heals a paralyzed man. Then it says that he's walking along. He notices Matthew in the tax booth. <laughs> it's really quick. Come follow me. You know, just be my disciple. That's it. And it just says he kind of just drops everything and goes. Doesn't give us any other information. Wow. Interesting. So later, Matthew's probably got a lot of money. He has a nice house or something. He invites Jesus and the disciples over for a party. Right? So they're hanging out. And then they get questioned. They're like, wait a minute. Why does your teacher, Matthew, hang out with all these disreputable sinners and tax collectors? Again, synonymous, a bad thing. But when the Pharisees saw this, <clears throat> they say, why does your teacher hang out with such scum? I'm calling them scum. <laughs> so when Jesus heard this, he famously says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added... Matthew 9, 13. Now, go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. Jesus is quoting Hosea right there, 6, 6. So Matthew is called and forgiven. And we see that a key to this forgiveness is mercy. It's having mercy. Compassion for others, especially for sinners. God desires this more than any so-called worship. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. So let's absorb that. It's an important statement. So he's quoting Hosea. And so now as you're reading this, if you haven't, put it all together, put this together. It should draw up that picture in your mind. I want you to show mercy. So, you, you know, you should be thinking of Gomer, even a prostitute wife, you know. Mercy. I want you to show mercy. So to drum up this context, I want context, and I want this more, you Pharisees, than all your fancy worship, right? All your high praises and fanciness and, you know, praying on the streets or showing off how much money you're giving. And so today's context, I want mercy more than your worship team, more than your fancy videos and lights, and more than your production, more than your good singers. I want you to show mercy. So think about that. Very important. It's compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone, especially when it's within your power to punish them, to let them off the hook. That's mercy. So simple things, really quick, right? They don't deserve it. And so let's think about the way Christians tip, <laughs> right? I find that really funny. I like actually get very embarrassed if I go to lunch with someone and they do one thing that they think is great. Like they're like, oh, pastor, I'll pay, I'll pay. I'm like, great. So they pay, but then they sit there and they calculate the tip down to the penny. I'm like, this is so embarrassing. Like I, really, I get embarrassed, very embarrassed. Like, stingy, you know? And, well, you know, the, the waitress wasn't great. <laughs> and you are? 
You know, maybe they need like a tip. Maybe they need something to make them happy. And perhaps a Christian could be, I don't know, the person who is obligated, by the way, to give them a good day. Wow. So think about it. <clears throat> Small thing. We're going to talk about bigger things. We saw that one key in people's relationships, in your relationships with everybody, whether it be you and the waitress or a spouse, is that keeping in mind the unseen things that they might be going through. Right? This person, her boyfriend could have just broke up with her because he realized he wasn't ugly. <laughs> right? Her dog could have just died. I don't know. Are you always smiling and happy everywhere you go? No. You got stuff going on. Mercy. So let's take a look at what it looks like to have mercy. A couple digressions here because I have to have a few disclaimers. But think about what Hosea did. Wow. That's mercy. That's extreme. Now here's the thing. Here's my disclaimer. I want to throw this on here. I have to. Adultery. It is very, very serious. It is the one and only reason that Jesus gives for justifiable divorce. It's bad. It's really bad. So here's, here's the fear, because this is what happens sometimes, is people, they run with it. God is making an extreme illustration here. It doesn't mean that, like, oh, I can just go. Gomer did it. It's not funny, but people do this kind of thing. Gomer shouldn't be used as an example of why someone can continue to, like, sin and sin and sin against the spouse. So please don't take this this way. Scriptures should not be manipulated or abused. This is an example with a specific context. So this is kind of necessary. I want to just give you a short note here or a shortish note here, <laughs> on forgiveness. You see, we need to look at the full counsel of God's word. We always, always have to forgive. But that doesn't talk about proximity. In fact, if Femi, I'm probably saying it wrong, my Greek teacher is going to tell me that later. <laughs> It means, that's forgive. When you see Jesus talking about forgive you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, that's, there's, that's the Greek word there. And it kind of, let it go. Let it go. So sometimes forgiving someone is actually letting them go. It's not the same thing as proximity. So if you get to Matthew 18, Jesus gives that hyperbolic teaching about hands, feet, and eyes. Like, if an eye causes you to sin, rip it out. Hand causes you to stumble. It's better to go into heaven with one hand or one eye than to hell with both your hands or both your eyes. So he gets through that, and then he gives a teaching that is probably well-known to church leadership more than regular people. So I'll just kind of explain it to you. It's kind of the one, two, three, strikes, you're out, reconciliation process. But most people say that's the church discipline scripture. And it's like, yeah, because that's the way you want to go. It's about reconciliation. It's about reconciliation. So what happens, right? So step one, pretty simple. Somebody sins against you, you go directly to them <laughs> and work it out for the purpose of reconciliation. But here's the thing, pastor rant for just a second. <laughs> if you've been in church for a long time, you notice very few people do this. Long time Christians, right? I know the word, I love Jesus, but I just don't want to listen to him or do anything he says. They go to like 10 other people first, right? And sometimes not that other person. But I'm a Christian somehow. Very interesting. And this happens to pastors all the time. People, are, you know why so-and-so left? I'm like, nope, they never had one meeting with me. They're like, well, they said they had 10 of them. I'm like, and they're a liar too. So, <laughs> you know, it, it happens a lot and it's disgusting. It's very bad. Go directly to that person and work it out. You didn't because you didn't want it to work out because you didn't forgive them. Ooh. Step two, if that doesn't work out, bring some other people, <laughs> right? A couple of witnesses, maybe for accountability, whatever it is. Try again. Try again. Work it out. Then, they don't listen, bring it to the church. Here's the funny thing. <laughs> If you pair that with 1 Timothy 5 and what Paul tells Timothy, <laughs> it's kind of scary. Rebuke them in front of the whole church so they're scared. No one wants to do what they did. 
don't worry. I try to get step two to work because <laughs> step three is kind of scary. But basically tell it to the church. Maybe you can bring in some more church leadership there in on the problem for the purpose of reconciliation. If that doesn't work, treat them like a tax collector or a sinner. That's it. Kick them out. If you couple that with 1 Corinthians 5, that's what we get. Out. <clears throat> so it didn't work out. Well, Goodbye. Jesus says, that's it. And if you read 1 Corinthians 5, same thing Paul's saying. They're out. One bad apple ruins the bunch. One lump of leaven causes the whole thing to rise. So in any relationship, if you have a serial sinner, a serial abuser, Jesus calls for separation there. But it doesn't mean you don't forgive them. You just forgive them from afar. Here's the funny thing. So after this teaching, Peter <laughs> comes up to Jesus. He's like, hey, um, how many times should I forgive someone? Like, he throws out a number. Seven? You know, is that cool? Like, seven times? And then Jesus is like, no, 70 times seven, 490 times. More hyperbole. You always forgive. Peter, you're not getting it. <laughs> it's not about forgiveness. You always forgive. It's not about proximity. Jesus already said, three strikes, they're out. You must always forgive that person, even if it's from afar. Balance. But it still stands. Matthew 5, 31. Right? Divorce. No good. Unless adultery is involved. Then, yeah, Jesus says it's okay to separate. Always forgive. Always forgive. So let's talk about some things we should be doing to stop it from getting there. And you can apply these things to any relationship. So if you're not married or whatever, you can apply it to friendships and different things, your family, things like that. Showing compassion in relationships. Now here's the thing. There are a lot of programs about relationships. There are a lot of programs for the church. <laughs> and I very rarely endorse them. I don't really like the program church. I'm not, you, know, you pay all this money for, and we've done it. We've tr I've tried, trust me. And it's just like, mm, it doesn't work. And then sometimes you find stuff in it where it's like not really biblical and uh, it's, it's just a mess. And why did I pay a lot of money for this? I could have just done that and everything would have been fine. You know, maybe Jesus actually had all the answers. That would be a really amazing surprise to a lot of church leaders nowadays. Like, hey, this person's really cool. And the other thing is, here's the other side of it, people worship. I hate people worship. If, if you get to know me and you get close, I hate it. It's like the tipping. It's very embarrassing. If someone sees someone famous and like, oh, let me get a selfie or something. I hate that. And especially now that I'm a Christian. We shouldn't be worshiping anybody but Jesus. That's it. That's it. Not me, not anybody. I don't like it. But you hear people, oh, so-and-so, he's so great. He's so great. I've been watching this. People come up to me like, who are you reading? You know, who are you reading? I'm like, God? <laughs> you know, like, how is your guy better than that? You know what I mean? Like, so, duh. You know, so I just, I hate people worship. I'm just... So that you know me, it's just like a thing. And my wife and I were laughing about it because something came up. And we used to know a lot of very, very famous people, really, really famous people. And so it just didn't phase us. And getting very, very close to us, they appreciated us because we just didn't treat them any different. And they liked that. They liked that. It was, it was helpful to them. So it's, that's why. But here's the thing in the Christian ministry, why it's so bad. Because you worship this person, and of course they do something wrong. Of course, they're a person, you know what I mean? And sometimes it's really bad, but then your whole world falls apart. You know, people fall away from the faith because, oh, so-and-so is doing something wrong. He's not God. Of course he's going to do something wrong. Are you crazy? Plus, he was letting you all worship him. Think about it, you know what I mean? Of course, he's, hello, you know, that's, that's no good. And so that's the problem with the program, the people, all that other stuff. Anyway, all that being said, and it's important to know, there is one program I've kind of endorsed. And I'm going to show you the problem with that one, too. The five love languages. I've endorsed this in the past. I've actually met the author and everything. Great guy, but he'll mess up. <laughs> but anyway, 
it's a good program. The idea is that you like take this test and, and maybe your spouse or your friend or whatever, you take this test together and then you find out how you receive love. Like how, how do I receive love? Because for some, you know, it's like gifts, right? That's my wife. She likes gifts, acts of service. Expensive, takes a lot of time. But anyway, <laughs> I like most guys, it's <laughs> I like physical touch, right? So a lot of guys do. And so if your wife comes home, right, you like the physical touch, she does not, and you're like, oh, all over her, she's like, get away from me, repulsed. Then you have an argument, whereas you should have just got the gift, and then you'd get the physical touch. Do that. <laughs> like, see? So it's like that. And so go ahead and look it up. That's the thing. But here's the thing. Here's the problem with that program. I discovered it later. <laughs> I couldn't believe it took me so long. Here's the problem with it. It causes you to search for what you should already know. Think about it. <laughs> the five love languages offers us another test. The test is a test. If you don't know your partner's answers already, you probably have a problem. If you don't know your answers already, you might be crazy. Think about it. It doesn't make sense. It's another test. You see, mercy and compassion, they involve understanding, knowing what the other person likes or doesn't like. <laughs> so, I'll just give you an example. I'm married. I'm your pastor, right? Maybe you haven't made that decision yet, and you're like, I don't know. But anyway, bring you into the household a little bit. <laughs> now, if you're newly or married or you're still working things out, wherever you're at, women are subtle most of the time. And so they're waiting for you to pick up on things, sometimes I think like subconsciously on purpose to test you to create a problem. But anyway, they're, they're like... Dropping hints, right? So that's another conversation. They're dropping hints, right? And you got to be picking it up, your husband. That's, that's your job. And most of the time, it's like that. But sometimes it's not. And I'll give you one example. Heather says, I hate doing laundry. I'm like, that's kind of hard not to hear. <laughs> I hate doing laundry. I had a bad day, so I was like, I'm definitely, at this point, obligated, right, to, to do something about this or forget it, right? And not what I want, no physical touch. So <clears throat> when I get a little free time, yeah, I know. And when I get a little free time, I do laundry. And when I did, I kind of started thinking, like, why she doesn't like it. Towels. Folding towels. Now, maybe some of you all have no hygienic skills at all and you don't care, but think about it. What do you use the towel for? You dry yourself off with the towel. Do you dry your face? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> well, you can't let the towel hit the floor. It's like a shoelace. You got to throw it away if it hits the floor. Another Seinfeld reference. It, you, the towel hits the floor, it's dirty again because the floor is dirty. That's where we put our feet. Don't rub your foot in my face. I did jujitsu for a long time. It had to happen a lot. It's gross. So don't do that. So what happens? If the towel hits the floor, it's got to go back in the wash. Or you just don't tell Jean that the towel hit the floor. That's probably how she solved the problem all the time. <laughs> like, but for me, I can't. So think about it. What if you're not around six feet tall? Right? If you're, so don't call your wife short either. You're just not super tall, right? So you got to hold the towel up while you fold it so it doesn't hit the floor. This has to be very strenuous on your shoulder muscles. So I totally get it. Not for her, though. She just doesn't like it. So I take a little time, and I give her her love languages. Love language. Don't always do the gifts, you know, pastor salary. Anyway, so that's one way in which I can show a little mercy and compassion, right? I know she doesn't like doing something. I do it for her. And then sometimes I get my love languages. It all works out. We need to listen. Mercy in the Greek is actually very interesting because it's connected with all these, like our words have a thought too. Like when you say an English word, it brings up a thought. Those words, it's usually very elaborate because sometimes they're compound words. This isn't, but it just it brings a lot of meanings to life. So when you see the word mercy in your Bible, a Greek person would see like giving to the poor. That's like how they see mercy, giving alms, you know, just giving something away, right? Showing, like, 
pity, if you will. And so we talked about go-tos last week. What we're going to instead of God. So you're addressing those. And I want to tie that in here because people going to something else, and it could be anything from adultery, and I told you that's not a good thing, so I'm not excusing that. Hear me loud and clear. But it could be adultery. It could be with your eyes. So, guys, that's a thing. Jesus says that. So maybe you're doing that. Right? You're looking at stuff on the net that you shouldn't be looking at. Then that's a go-to instead of God. Maybe it's alcohol. You know, maybe it's drugs. It's a go-to. Right? Same root, different branch. You're just going to something else to soothe yourself instead of God. Food. A lot of people do that. That's a real thing. Right? So I laugh when people are like, oh, yeah, you know, I haven't had anything to drink in 10 years, but you know, I stuffed my face or whatever. It's like, well, you're still not in recovery. You're not. If you're going to something, you're not. It's got to be God. But here's the other side of it. So, yeah, you might be like, I hate this guy. But the other side of it is, whoa, whoa, whoa. if we have a friend, a spouse, a lover, whatever it is, who's going to a lot of things except God, they're needy. They're needy. And they need us. They need us to show mercy. Not in arguments, right? not a criticism, because you got your own stuff. Just If you feel like doing that, just go look in the mirror. Just do that. Stop. You need to show them mercy and compassion. They're going through something. They're not doing that to hurt you. There's just something missing, and it's called God. That's what's missing. And so in doing this, here's another thing. We're not trying to replace God trying to represent him. We can be the hands and feet of Jesus. We looked at 1 Peter last week, so as we close, we'll continue there. We see here, if we get to chapter 2, for example, we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. That's really what it is, like 2 through 1 Peter 3. So I don't say that. Sorry, 1 Peter. <clears throat> as you go through there, that's what the whole thing's about, and here's what your heart should be hearing. In all your different relationships... As hard as they can be, you're supposed to think of yourself as a representative of Jesus Christ. What we do to people can just chase people away from the faith. So, authorities, 1 Peter 2, honor the emperor, even if he's burning us alive. That's what's happening there, by the way. Right? So pay your taxes, that kind of thing. Just honor authorities. We could win them over, even in death. That's the thought. Hard read. Slaves. That's not a thing now, but employees, even if you're being treated harshly, work hard. Win your employer over to Jesus. That's what it's about. We turn the page, 1 Peter 3, 1. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, the gospel, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Clear? That's the point here. If we continue, 1 Peter 3, 7. That's where the husbands stop reading. Here's where the women continue. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers won't be hindered. That's a thing. Interesting. And to all Christians, 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tenderhearted, and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. We are all to be goodwill ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Just as you have been forgiven, you must also forgive. Just as you have been shown mercy, you must also show mercy. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's an absolute. 
If we look again at 1 Peter, I want to close with this thought. 1 Peter 2, 8. They stumble, these people who have rejected Christ, is the context, because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. That is a quote of Hosea 1. Six. Now that you have received mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, contemplate that, you must also show mercy. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, for this day, everyone who had the heart and inclination to come here and be a part of the body of Christ that is the people, not the building. Although we thank you for it and everything that we can do with it. I just encourage everyone in the sound of my voice to just fashion themselves into vehicles of your grace, your love, and your mercy as they interact with everyone for whom Jesus died this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.